Well, we are back here on the Heroic Mindset. My name is Dr. Tom Davis, and I'm here with my co-host, Larry Sunderland. And today, we're going to take a little detour. We're going to be talking about something that everybody is talking about, it seems like. And that is the documentary on Michael Jordan's career called The Last Dance. There are so many things to talk about in, in that series. And it's just been so fascinating and so interesting. And so we really want to talk about how this, uh, the lessons that we are picking up from that, what does that look like as far as an athlete is concerned? And what should they be adopting? And what should they maybe be leaving behind in some of the things that were talked about? And from a coaching perspective, Larry, I'm sure is going to have some really insightful ideas on what that looks like to coach athletes like that. And how do you coach them? And what does that kind of uh, what Michael Jordan brings, what does it do to an environment, both on a positive and a negative side? So we're going to deal in with, with all of that. We're going to be diving in. Larry, it's good to be back on the podcast with you. Well, Tom, it's great to be here. Great speaking with you again. Um, and, and boy, it's been fun watching The Last Dance over the, over the last few weeks. It's, uh, it, like you said, super, super interesting. Um, and, and man, I, you know, from, from the coaching standpoint, I, I wish we got more from Phil Jackson. You know, I, I wish we could have spent more time with Phil Jackson there and how we manage that dynamic. But what a show, you know. And, and for me personally, I was in Chicago for the better part of those, of those times. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's near and dear to my heart. Um, I, I am a Bulls fan. Um, it, th- those were difficult times for me because I'm probably more of a Knicks fan than I am a Bulls fan. And the Knicks could just never get by the Bulls. So um, I watched the series with a great deal of interest because it's kind of close to my heart and, and, a, and a super, super interesting topic like you mentioned. Yeah, I have a feeling that Phil was the secret weapon in all of that. Um, I'm with you. I would have loved to have heard more from from his perspective. Maybe that'll be the next documentary on his life. Did you watch it with with your whole clan? I did. Yeah, I watched it with. Uh, well, certainly with my my two boys. Um, you know, Lawson Lawson was here. Went back to Spain today, but he was here from Spain. So he and uh, and my youngest boy, we we watched every night intently. Um, had some good conversations around it. I bet you did. How did it feel to put your boy back on an airplane today for Spain? Yeah, tough day today. You know, um, he was home for almost two months, and that's that's the longest period of time I think that we've had him home since he was 15. Hmm. So, um, you know, you get into a routine. Wow. And, yeah, you get to have some fun. Um, so it was tough, and it was hard hard for his brother too. You know, that's always a tough thing when they when they separate. Well, I can only imagine. I know having boys, how difficult that is when you put them on an airplane and not going to see him for a long time, but we're at least happy to have him. We'll, we'll take good care of him, try and fatten him up and keep those calories <laughs> in his body for this next season he's got to face. <laughs> and how, how are things there, Tom? How are you guys doing? Uh, we are, we're better. I mean, we're in phase 0.5, they call it, which means that everyone and their dog is exercising. And, and when I say that, I am not kidding. I think I'm going to post a video of it. There are so many people on bikes. We, all, we can only exercise between certain hours. So it's 6 to 10 in the morning, and then it's 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. in the evening. And so they, they still haven't opened up shops. The, the point five, which started today, is some shops can open up, but still no restaurants, still no beaches. But I, I think that the good thing is you can start to feel things getting better, right? I mean, it's like there's hope in the air, and there's anticipation, and people are starting to come alive again and um, hope this was all just a, a, a bad dream they woke up from. So you can sense that in the city. We're, we're, very, we're very focused on, on living a normal life again, as I'm sure you are. Yeah, uh, things here are kind of similar. They're beginning to open up a little bit more with uh, restaurants and, and bars and stuff, allowing outdoor seating. Um, so those are things. I think you're starting to feel more human again. You're starting to see people again a bit more, you know, um, and I, and I think you touched on something really interesting and something that was mentioned last night in, in uh, the last S was the word hope. Um, mm-hmm. it, it, it's, a, it's a great, great motivator. It is. It is one of my values. Very important to me. So let's jump in here with, and talk about Michael Jordan because I think that when you think of peak performance, when you think of an athlete who is in the zone, right, mm-hmm. who is in flow, 
the person that comes to your mind probably more than almost anyone is Michael Jordan. And like you, I remember, well, I wasn't living in Chicago, but I watched all those Bulls games. I remember that the Bulls were everything. No one had ever heard of the Bulls before. Uh, I mean, if you didn't live there, no, no offense. <laughs> but then Michael Jordan comes along and the whole world knows. And, you know, I even, we talked about him in one of our last podcasts about the fact that, you know, he had a mindset that was different than everybody else's. And he was cut from his high school varsity team. He didn't even make, I mean, can you imagine after seeing that documentary that you would cut Michael Jordan? I mean, it, it's just, I mean, come on. But yeah. one of the things too, and I think before maybe we, we jump in here and talk about some of these issues, because there's good issues and bad issues, right? That came out in that documentary. Sure. And I think we need to talk about both. And I, I would like to talk about what that looks like from uh, an athletic perspective. Is that even something anyone can, can, can strive for? Uh, and then, and then at, at, towards the, the end of the podcast, Larry, I really want to, you know, find out what you learned. And because he obviously did some things well, and he did some things that he didn't do, he didn't do well, quite frankly, mm -hmm. wrong. And I'm sure that's happened to you in your professional career. And I'm sure you've done that with coaching. So I want to, I want to dig in and find out what that looks like and, and what maybe you would say to your, your, uh, your young self, if you could, knowing what yeah. you've learned l looking back. Yeah. But uh, I think maybe let's, let's jump into this first because there's one thing that is true about Michael Jordan, and I, I believe at least, and that is that he's an outlier, right? Mm -hmm. And what I mean is an outlier is someone that you, you, can't build a, um, you can't build a program around as far as like how to, how to do what he did, <laughs> right? I mean, like here's the Michael Jordan way of becoming the best in the world. I mean, he was extraordinary. Here's the cookie cutter. Here's the cookie cutter. You do this, do this, and you'll be the next Michael Jordan. Exactly. Doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah, he was way too complex, right? Um, and, and so even I think that's an important point in the beginning of, of what we're going to talk about because there's a lot of things you can't emulate from Michael Jordan, but there's a lot of things that he did that made him an outlier, that made him one of the best basketball players in the world, right? That was, you know, when you're when, – we, we often talk about this too with, with soccer, especially over here. I, I know you guys do, but when you're playing at this kind of an elite level, right? Like, like our boys have had a chance to play. Um, your, your boys have had a chance to play. You've played at, you got to be a little bit crazy, you know? And I mean that in a good way, right? Did you guys ever talk about that as, as professional athletes? I mean, you gotta, you gotta kind of have a screw loose somewhere. I mean, there's gotta be something like you just to work that hard to train that hard. I mean, there's, you, you, you're taking that to a completely different level. Yeah, th there's, you know, to be fair, I, I, there's a certain amount of selfishness that, that comes with, uh, achieving at, 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 you know, at the highest level in anything, right? Because, because you're so dedicated to it and often you tend to focus on yourself maybe to the detriment of others. Right. And, and, and I've often, I've often thought about that, you know, where, where what was most important to me was being ready to play on the weekend. What was most important to me was being fit and, and being ready to go preseason. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, and other things get pushed aside, you know, and, and, you know, we call them sacrifices, but often it, it wasn't a sacrifice to me because I was, it was about me, mm -hmm. you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes I, I feel there's a certain amount of selfishness and maybe that's where we, maybe that's a little bit of the craziness, right? Um, mm -hmm. I find that, that I find that really interesting what you're saying. So I have a question I'd like to dig into a little bit because I think you're right. Um, I mean, you certainly see that with Michael Jordan, right? Sure. But, but how I, my question is, how do you deal with that with what we've been talking about? Because what we've been talking about to build trust and these kinds of things that, that it has to shift, right? You have to shift from it being all about me to being about we, like you really have to care about the team. I mean, we heard Carrie talk last, last podcast about their values at San Diego Loyal. And, you know, I mean, yeah. it's gratitude and compassion. I mean, these are not selfish types of values, right? These aren't, these aren't selfish mm -hmm. things that you engage in. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think even Michael Jordan had to deal with that because, you know, they said in there, you know, whether you, you think it's true or not, that, you know, he couldn't have won a championship without a Scottie Pippen and a Dennis Rodman, those kinds of players. So how do you balance that? Yeah, I, I think, <laughs> interesting. Personally, for me, I, I think when, when I came to the realization that, you know what, I'm not good enough 
for it to just be about me. Does that, does that make sense? I wasn't a good enough player for it to just be about me because without anybody else, I was never going to find success. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I wasn't, I wasn't that uber talented player, you know, maybe, maybe a Michael Jordan, he can be more selfish than anybody else because man, he can back it up, you know, and, and, and maybe he can get away with, you know, and, and we can get into the technical differences of basketball and soccer, right? He can really, really influence the game of basketball. Well, because there's five players on, on the court and, and the court, the field is smaller. So we can influence every phase of the game. But now you take that to soccer. Mm-hmm. It's a much bigger field. It's 11 versus 11. Now, Lionel Messi. Wow. Uh, you know, uber performer. Mm-hmm. Okay. But I don't know that, that he can necessarily have the impact on a game that Michael Jordan can have overall with everything. Right. So, you know, if you remember, Michael Jordan was also the, the defensive MVP of the NBA. Right. Right. I, I, that's, that's a unique, a unique sport that creates a unique cir- set of circumstances where maybe Michael Jordan can be so good that he could excel and he could become maybe more selfish in that or, or more, uh, you know, they talk about him being in the moment. He can be in that moment for himself. He knows what he has to do because he can influence it. Whereas in a game of soccer, you know, I, I don't think you would ever consider uh, Messi the La Liga defensive MVP, right? It's, it's a different set of circumstances. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and I, and I think that, you know, you're right, is, is that you say, well, I, I wasn't that good. But what, it, you know, that the, begs the question, what if you are that good? Right. And I think even though Michael Jordan and again, there's only one Michael Jordan, uh, there's only one of these kind of athletes that he still needed to do things differently. Right. He, he, he even he needed to learn to grow along the road. I'm sure it was hard for him because I, I was just thinking that you know, he's a superstar his whole life after that incident with his high school basketball team. But he just he just performed. And, and we'll talk about his mindset in a minute because it was over the top. Right. <laughs> with with winning. But he also had to find a way to build this kind of camaraderie with, with his teammates because, I mean, there's a lot of things that people said that he was a jerk and a butthole, but, it, you know, sometimes it wasn't working that way. It wasn't working for the team. And when Scotty went out, I mean, they were, they were struggling, right, which then kind of brought out some more of his negative idiosyncrasies. But mm-hmm. um, the thing that I wish they would have talked more about is this element of, of their, their camaraderie and what what belief looked like they had. I mean, cause you know, they believed in each other. They believed yeah. in their, I mean, you started to see that with his relationship with Steve Kerr, right? Uh, yeah. Which didn't, didn't start out too well. <laughs> he punched right. him in the face, <laughs> but, but, um, but then he got over that and then he actually humbled himself and, and, and he made a decision that wasn't about him, that it was mm-hmm. about the team. And he called him and he apologized. And that seemed mm-hmm. to be where their relationship took a completely different turn. And then it was Steve who hit that shot for them to win the yep. finals. And, yep. and, and so, so he did. I mean, maybe he, maybe he would have acted differently younger. I don't know. But uh, even a Michael Jordan needs teammates. Even a Michael Jordan needs to build trust. Even a Michael Jordan needs to, to instill belief. Uh, I mean, he obviously had that in himself, but in with his team too. I mean, I do, I, I, but I do think it's different for a superstar like that than it is for us mere mortals. Yeah. You know, I, I'd, I'd love to dig into that a little bit because, you know, we, we spoke about, I think it was week before last, we spoke about how trust-based teams outperform non-trust-based teams right. by 286%. Right. We, mm-hmm. we spoke mm-hmm. about, we spoke about what that looked like. And we spoke about the idea of psychological safety. Right. Right. Now, I don't know if there was a lot of psychological safety happening, you know, on the, on the court every day when the bulls were training. Didn't seem to be. <laughs> um, didn't seem to be. And, and, I, and I, think, I think we can, we can, we have to keep the Phil Jackson element out there, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Because this, this guru maybe found a way to bring the psychological safety that we talk about back into it, right? But, right. but I think as it related directly to Michael Jordan and his relationship with the teammates, I don't think Michael Jordan was a person creating an element of psychological safety with his players, right? I agree. So, so can we, is there a different type of, in this scenario, a different type of trust-based uh, climate that, that, was, that was in action, right? And, 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 I, and I thought about this, Tom, 
Michael Jordan was such a a unique um, personality, both as a player, right? So dominant. And then his personality was very, very, very dominant, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and he manhandled players, right? Uh, on his own team, okay? So I, you have to, if you are that demanding, and, and in fact at times going to demean a teammate, you have to be that spectacular of a performer that you can carry the load for the team and win, right? Which ultimately at the professional level, it's about winning, okay? So if you can do that, are you building a different type of trust within your teammates where they're saying, listen, I'll do whatever Michael Jordan wants me to do because I know he's going to bring us to the promised land. I trust that he'll do that. And you know what? If he wants to treat me like shit along the way, I'll take it because in retrospect, he's making me better. And we all see that from the players as they talk about it. But in the moment, I'm taking it, not because I like it, but because I know he's going he's gonna to deliver on the court. Yeah. Right? So, it, it, you know, there's this different trust element that happens there, I think. Well, you know, what, what's interesting is what you're saying is that I teach something uh, that, that is called the leadership ladder. I didn't invent this by any stretch. I think uh, John Maxwell did. But in the leadership ladder, it talks about the levels of leadership. And so the lowest form of leadership is leadership by title, right? So I'm the boss, do what I say. And so people follow you because they have to. And the idea is you want to move up these stages of the leadership ladder. And then the next stage is that people follow you because they want to. Well, as it starts to get towards the top, people follow you because you produce amazing results, right? And, and momentum starts to occur. And so, yeah, I mean, who probably didn't want to play with Michael Jordan? The, you know, he was helping them to win all of these games. I mean, the results were there. And so then maybe you, in, in that case, you, you take a little more crap than, than you would on another team because it's Michael Jordan and you're winning and you can win the championship and everyone's goal is to win the championship, right? But I, I think that, that when you have that, it's just like the winning at all costs uh, that you don't ever reach that top level of leadership, which is leadership by personhood. Right. Where people are, I mean, like your character, it's about who you are, like you defined your life by these things. Uh, I mean, you know, if we talked about Michael Jordan, I think that Michael Jordan, everything that he was, was to be the best basketball player in the world. Yes. Right. But that's about what he does, not who he is. Right. Right. Which is a whole, uh, we could go into that a lot deeper, but, but Yeah. yeah, he achieved his goal. But I mean, his mindset, and he said this over and over, when at all costs. Yes. But, right? but, but, but there's an interesting contract, contrast there because that wasn't necessarily Phil Jackson's message. And you heard that when, when you got to see little snippets of true, Phil Jackson. That's true. That's he true. was very process-oriented. You know? Yeah, he was. He was. So, so it's really interesting, that contrast there. And I think, you, you know, was Phil Jackson the secret sauce that, that allowed Michael to be this dominant player and and dominant personality yeah what would what kind of a player would michael jackson have been uh michael jackson michael jordan been uh without his coach without phil jackson i mean you know he may he may have been great but he may never have arrived to that level because they were they were yin and yang i mean they perfectly balanced each other and and then you know and then you go beyond that and you go the the structure and makeup of the team you know this is we're talking about professional level right and you get to pick the teammates as a GM or as a coach, you get to pick the teammates that are going to maybe um, compliment Michael Jordan or maybe that can work for Michael Jordan, right? You know, when you look at a Dennis Rodman, he brought a whole, a whole slew of, you know, special circumstances. <laughs> but, but they found a way to make that work, even to the, even to the extent where, you know, he goes and, and does a wrestling match during the finals, you know, right. And, right. and it's okay. You know, when, when they come back, um, that's, there's, there's, there's so much swirling kind of around this whole Michael Jordan situation, right? There's, right. there's so many things around it. Right. Yeah. And, and so from a mindset perspective, I, I'd, I'd like to dive into this whole idea of Michael Jordan's mindset to win at all costs, mm-hmm. right? Is that a good thing or is that not a good thing? I mean, obviously that he won. Right. I mean, I mean, he was a winner, but I I started to think about that. Like, you know, would I want to be teaching my, my boys in their sport win at all costs 
And he, I mean, it, don't get me wrong. It allowed him to go to a completely different level. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think that the other thing that helped him go to a level is for some reason, if someone offended him, man, you were toast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, don't, don't, don't poke the bear. Um, and you yeah. saw that over and over again. It didn't matter if it was Reggie Jackson or, or, or who it, who it was when that happened. Um, Reggie Miller. Sorry. I keep getting my names messed up, but, um, <laughs> But when it all costs, because what's the flip side of that? I mean, mm. what, what does it do to you when winning is everything? Yeah. It, 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 for me, it's, it's, a, it's an ego-driven mindset, right, which, which is very fragile because what happens when you don't win? Right. When you're defined by winning, what happens when you don't win, right? You, 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 you touched on it before, right? Who are you? If you're defined by winning – what happens when it when you don't win? So you sit there and you look at this this really unique situation of of the Chicago Bulls. This this a different type of trust based group that was built around trust in yes the coach yeah Phil Jackson had something to do with it obviously but built around this this uh, in, incredible performer. Okay, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well, what happens if they lose? What happens if this incredible performer can't deliver? Right. Right. And and to me, the most incredible thing about this this six championships out of eight years is this type of environment, this type of climate is really, really fickle. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and it, it's typically very short, short term. Mm -hmm. And wow, the Bulls did it six out of eight years, mm -hmm. you know, and that's incredible. It is. Yeah. And you, so you you're you're talking about I, I like where you're going with this, this whole idea of how egocentric that it is, right? Because the other message, and, and I think that it's important to think about what you're actually saying when you decide something, right? So in this case, it's like the winning was everything. Your value was in winning, right? Your, your worth was in winning. So what happens? If, you, if you're not a winner, if you're not performing at the highest level, then you get berated, you get cussed out, you get punched in the face, right? I mean, I, mean I, I realize that you, know, you can get heated in any sport, I mean, that's not what I'm referring to. I'm, I'm talking, you know, the ongoing part of this, that if my value is in winning, then when I win, I am a winner. And when I don't, I am a failure. Right? Yes. And, and, and when you define yourself like that, I think this is what you're saying, that the ego is large and in charge. So, so imagine, for example, that you have a kid on a soccer team who decides, hey, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm, I'm super good at, at my sport. I'm going to, I'm going to be like Mike in, in this case. <laughs> and, and so, um, you know, he becomes the one who's the jerk on the team and, you know, he, he starts berating other players, right? We got to win. What's the matter with you? Get your head out of your rear, right? All of these, yeah. these things that are, are happening because, you know, they're doing what they're, they're seeing Michael Jordan do work for him. Yeah, uh, 100%. And I think this is one of the reasons wh when you and I were talking about today, you know, we wanted to talk about this with everybody because th like we said, there are so many, so many great things and there's so many great um, things that Michael Jordan did and, so, and his mindset, right? Some of this stuff is, is brilliant, but we also wanted to make sure that, that coaches dig a little bit deeper into the message, right? And we spoke mm -hmm. about that maybe on our first podcast when we spoke about, um, Van Piercy, Robin Van Piercy, and his mm -hmm. conversation with his son in the car, right? Where, where he, he called this, he essentially called his son a loser, right? He said, you sound like a loser, remember? Right. <laughs> and, and we talked about that and we said, so I saw a lot of stuff on Twitter, right? That was like, yeah, spot on. I love that. Tough love. You can say those things. Great. And I sit there and I go, okay, well, if I show up in the 17 national team and I grab a player off the field and I'm walking off with them, I go, you know what? You sound like a loser that may not go very far, right. right? That may not have the right impact on that player because it hasn't been based on some foundation of trust and built over time, right? Yeah. So I, I think this is, there's a caution to the way when we look at it, we go, well, look at what Michael Jordan did. I want to be like Mike. Okay, he's an outlier. Be careful, right? Because there were, we've talked about so many dynamics around that group that made it work. And just how fragile it was. Mm -hmm. And just how, you know, think about if Michael Jordan had gotten hurt. What would happen? What happens? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, for sure. And then and I think that 
that the other part of that too is that when you're so focused on winning, winning becomes everything, right? Mm-hmm. Everything. Then you're really good at winning, but you're shortchanging yourself in all these other areas of life, right? I mean, what about like the other parts that are important, like developing people skills and becoming emotionally intelligent and and learning how to deal with a health in a healthy way, things like right. failure or when you're not able to perform or whatever. I mean, you know, I think you maybe maybe psychologists could argue that maybe Michael didn't deal with a lot of things well sometimes. I mean, he obviously had some there were some gambling issues and you know, um, his marriage didn't last. And I mean, there's a a lot of things that, that kind of unraveled out of that. But I think that when you get so zeroed in, it reminds me of Boris Becker. Okay. Boris Becker, uh, won the Wimbledon two times. He was one of the youngest people to win the Wimbledon. And I teach a lot of this in, in, in the internally driven and externally driven aspects of my, my work, my leadership work. And, and so, you know, if you win the Wimbledon in tennis, you're, you're it. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. Right. You have all of the fame, all the fortune, everything you could ever want. Well, he wins the Wimbledon twice and then tries to commit suicide. And -hmm. the people around him were just flabbergasted. They couldn't believe it. They were shocked. And they were like, Boris, I mean, he he didn't succeed. Um, But they were like, Boris, how? Like, what are you doing? Like, you've got everything you could want. You've got it all. Everything. You've won everything at your age and you have everything. What, why would you try to commit suicide? And he said something I think, Larry, is deeply profound. He said, I wish when I got to the top, somebody would have told me there's nothing there. Mm-hmm. Now, that's the definition of somebody who lives their life from an externally driven perspective. When I get the, to win the Wimbledon, then I'm going to feel whole. I'm going to feel like my life has meaning. Then people are going to love me. Then I'm going to have all of these things, right? When I get that, when I get the CEO job at this role, then I'm going to feel that. When I get this amount of money, then I'm going to feel complete. And you know what? I wish when I got to the top, somebody would have told me there's nothing there. Yeah. And I think there's some of that, right? That, 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 that can be a real danger. And this is, this is why. So, um, you know, and by the way, you should do this with me in October. Every year I do a walk on the Camino de Santiago which is a, it's this pilgrimage, um, spiritual pilgrimage that goes from southern France all the way across northern Spain and you end up in Santiago. And if you did the whole thing, it would take us 30 days. So I'm not suggesting that. <laughs> I want to do that one day. But, but I, I, I that like the last 30 days might have been good for that. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly, except it would have been all closed, <laughs> right? So you'd have to take in a tent. Uh, you'd have been arrested. Yeah. But um. I had a friend on that walk. We only do, we do like seven days at a time and, and he's very successful in business. And we were, you know, when you're on those kinds of, of uh, experiences, you're very open and honest with your successes, but your struggles, your pains, right? And he was sharing this with me, uh, my friend, John, and he was telling me that um, he had lost his marriage and he had, uh, there, there was, he was just talking about the, the stress and the struggles that came along with that relationship with the kids. And he said, you know, my whole life, uh, our whole family is taught, we got to, we, we got to win at all costs. Mm. And you, you win and, and he was in sales. I think he has still the, the, the biggest, um, uh, the, the biggest record for a sale ever. Right. And, and it was this huge company. And so he did everything great. He blew away his competition. He won, he won. It's what he said. It's what his dad taught him. It's just, that was it. You win at all costs. And he said, I wish I would have paid as much attention to the other areas of my life. I wish that the other areas of my life that were as important to me, I would have approached with similar intensity. But he was so myopic that he got that goal of winning, but there were a lot of things that it cost him in the process too. Yeah, I I think, um, I I think unfortunately, um, these reflections come after the fact, don't they? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I think that's, I think that's really, really, it's critical and one of the things for myself personally that that I've tried to work on this idea of um, of experimenting right of change and and I want to learn personally I want to learn about the other things that are out there because I think they can make they can make winning that much more satisfying right don't get me wrong I want I want to win of course right it's it's in I, I think I hope sometimes people aren't listening to you and I talk and go, oh yeah that's soft listen I don't know that I don't know that I've ever been accused of being soft, right? As a player or as a coach, right? And and, and I want to hear, hear some of those stories. <laughs> <laughs> Just talk to some of my players, but but I I 
I want to win the right way and I want it to be lasting and I want it to affect other areas of my life, right? I, I, I want it to help grow other areas of my life. I want to win, not, I don't want to win just on the field. I want to win off the field too. And I want the same thing for my players, right? right. And, and, and look, we can get back to Jordan and go, okay, so when his playing days were over, I get the sense he's still trying to find what replaces that rush that he got from winning. Yes. Yeah. I, I think you definitely saw that. Well, they didn't talk about this in the series, but when he went to the Washington Wizards, it didn't go so well, right? Because he was in management and he was there for two years and it, it, it didn't go well at all. And there, you know, who knows what happened, but, you know, he didn't have those leadership skills to build trust and to get along with people, believe in people and all of that. I mean, it was a different environment and it didn't end well, right? I think he was, he was let go from that position by the, 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 the owner and and I, so, I think you can you you can also look at his gambling stuff you know mm -hmm. that that he had right and and this mm -hmm. is not a, I'm not I'm a big big Michael Jordan fan so we're not sitting here like sure. sagging Michael Jordan any means but but I, but I again you need to look deeper at things right and I think his gambling was him trying to replace the rush he got from driving to win right wow. that yeah. was that was the rush he got from gambling. So, right. Like I said, I lived in the Chicago area. Right. And there were stories all over Chicago of him being on the golf course. Right. He loved to golf. Right. Um, and he and, loves and cigars. He loves cigars. and He loves to golf. Right. And and he would be on the golf course and and, you know, and he played golf with some heavy hitters, obviously. Right. And they'd get up on the green and it'd be time to putt. And sure enough, 100 grand. Right. <laughs> and, and it's just this intimidation. So there's a story out there that he was playing golf and, um, and they, they got to a hole and uh, I'm trying to remember how this, how the, the, it was a pro, right? It was the, the local club pro and they got up there and they said, Hey, how about the pro said, how about a little side wager? Uh, mm -hmm. And, and they okay. And, and the pro goes, uh, the pro goes, how much? And Jordan looks at him and goes, whatever's going to make you uncomfortable. <laughs> right. And, and, and again, that's, that's the same thing he did to his teammates. That's the same thing he did to his opponents, right? A tremendous trash talker, right. But always trying to make his opponents uncomfortable, trying to make his teammates uncomfortable. You know, we've talked about comfort zone and stuff like that, trying to get people out of that, out of that comfort zone, because that was where he could, you know, he could manipulate them psychologically um, take charge too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that adrenaline rush was certainly yes. there. Right. And, and you see this with people. I mean, we get addicted to the deal or being busy. I mean, that's the big one. Right. Or being distracted on our on our iPhones or, or whatever that looks like. Um, but yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree. And, you know, th th there's so many messages in these kinds of things, too. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's it's this. I, I mean, I remember as a young father and I, I'm not proud of this. But when my kids, we played very high level for when your kids are young. And, and I remember that and I come from a pretty difficult background, right? So uh, I'm very like performance driven, like, and that it was in my psyche. I couldn't help it. You know, if you, if you do great on the field and I'm talking about me personally, then you're, you're a champion, right? I mean, I, uh, I was state champion wrestler and I lost two matches one season. And I mean, I felt like a failure when I lost those matches. And because it was all I had, my value was in how well I performed, right? And I think that this, this does happen to athletes. And so now I, I see my kids out there and they're making the same I'm like, <laughs> on the sidelines. And I know everybody's seen these parents. So I, listen, I've, I've repented for this. Okay. So don't judge me. <laughs> um, you know, what are you doing? You know, come on, Finn. I think I'm doing the right thing, right? By, you know, you've got to be like a champion. You've got to have a winning mindset. And, and, and uh, what I didn't realize is that I was, I was teaching my own kids this idea of, hey, when you succeed on the field, then you're a winner. Yep. And when you don't, well, you know, then it's up in the air. Yep. Right? So yep. you better perform at all costs. And so one of the things that I completely left out of that equation is because, you know, I mean, that, what you're doing in that case is you're instilling a, perfectionist, a profession, perfectionistic mm -hmm. mindset. Mm -hmm. What happens when that occurs is that now, you know what, you better be perfect because, if you step outside of that, of that perfection zone, then, then you might fail. So you better Very be difficult. safe. Yeah, really difficult to grow there, right? 
really difficult to grow. Exactly. Like, and if you're coaching this way, this is, this is what you're going to get. You know, yeah. you're not going to, the kids aren't going to like take risks and be those, those players that are explosive and are creative, right? That's what you, and I think that's what we're trying to get at with this mindset piece is that you have to define these things. It's like, you know, if it's all about winning and if it's all about making the perfect pass, then what you're going to do is have a team of robots that aren't going to be able to be creative and they're not going to be able to, they're going to struggle to win those high level games because they're too afraid of doing the wrong thing. I, I think that's a great point. And, and, and you know where you see this often, you know, with accountability, right? Because, because if, if you're judged on that perfectionism, well, are you going to raise your hand? Right. If something goes wrong, are you going to raise your hand and go, yeah, that was me. I need to do better. No way. No way. No way. You're going to ask for help. Exactly. No, can't do that. And, and I thought, I thought that was a really interesting thing. You know, when, when you look at maybe the dynamic going back to the bulls and to Jordan, that I, I felt like the players were held accountable by Michael Jordan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, rather than rather than it being an idea of sharing the accountability i i and i could be totally wrong again and, and all this stuff we're outsiders looking in with, right. with a limited amount of of information but i do know in 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 a trust-based um environment in a trust-based climate i i do know that accountability is something we all want to be held to right? It's, it's a, it's a feeling of service. So, so everybody want, you want to be held accountable. If that makes sense. When, when I'm, when I'm working for my teammate, I want to be held accountable in, in that aspect. And I think that's, if you get to that point, you have something that's much, much longer lasting and is not, is not fickle. Yes, I agree. Right. It, it, it reminds me of the, the illustration you gave last week when you talked about that that video that's gone all over the internet of that basketball team, college basketball team where the, yeah. the big player was hanging his head because he obviously didn't make the shot and his teammate came and held his head up high. He's like, you, you hold your head up high. You know, yes. we're going to get him next time. It's, it's those kinds of things, right? The failure doesn't mean you're a failure. It just means, Hey, it turns out that way. Sometimes what did you learn? How do you grow, create that growth mindset, right? How can you create success the next time? Because, of what you experienced. And if you, if you don't have what you're talking about, then, then it's going to be hard to grow, right? It's going to be, it's going to be hard to get there. And I know I've heard some statistics. I, I don't really believe some of the statistics, but that like 70% of, of youth athletes quit before the age of 13 because they're being berated by their parents. Mm -hmm. um, I, and again, I don't have any research on this. I haven't really dug into it, but I, I think there's a lot of other factors that go into this, but but a lot of that is because they're saying that, that it is this perfectionistic mindset, right? You have to be a winner. You have to do this. And it's the, you know, two to, 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 to four hour uh, car drives that, that they're just constantly told what they didn't do right, what they didn't do right, what they didn't do right. And so then you have the positive to negative ratios. If you're going to be healthy as an athlete, you've got to keep three positives in your life to every one negative. It's not that you're not ever going to be told, hey, that was the wrong move. Here's what you should have done, right? Um, but, but you're not even going to want feedback in those cases because you feel like if you get negative feedback or constructive criticism, then that's telling you what you, what you didn't do right, right? It's telling you that you aren't a winner. It's telling you that you, you don't have the, what it takes. And I think the higher level that you get, especially in football, in, in um, soccer, I mean, I guess it's this way for any sport, but I mean, we see this a ton over here, I know you see this at the academy level, your, your margin of error to not be the very, very best gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And so I think a healthy mindset in those, area, in those kinds of environments of high performance, elite performance, helps kids to know, hey, listen, you're talented, you're amazing, but you're going to make mistakes. And it's okay to make mistakes, right? I mean, this, this is what a fixed mindset does, a fixed mindset. So if a coach is a fixed mindset or a parent is a fixed mindset, what they end up doing is they praise that kid for their talent. Man, you're amazing. You're so talented. You have, your technical skills are through the roof, right? I mean, they're praising them for what they do. But then what happens when their technical skills aren't through the roof? 
What happens when they don't play amazing? Does that mean the opposite at that or point? Someone, or someone else is better. Yeah. And it's always going to happen. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. And, and then, I mean, they find that there's a research, a whole research study on this is that you have these super, super bright kids who are told their whole life, Hey, you're so smart. And they're praised for how smart they are. They make straight A's. You're so smart. You're so intelligent. You're, you're, you're unbelievable. You're doing all these incredible things. It's all about right. What they have to do. And so then they go to Harvard or Yale or Princeton or Stanford and they're average. Mm -hmm. <laughs> compared to the other kids that are there because now you've got a whole group of kids who've been told that their whole life and many of them spiral they spiral into depression they spiral into all kinds of things because now i i don't make the best grades what does that yeah. say about me and, and you see it all the time in sport in, in sports tom you, you see players that have never dealt with adversity they've always mm. been the best from the time they were a youth player and, and their, their pathway is linear. They've never had to deal with adversity. And all of a sudden, they hit adversity and they crash. Yeah. And unfortunately, if you don't have the right mentor, if you don't have the right coach, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that crash is often permanent. Right. You, like, don't re you don't recover from that one. You don't recover from that. You don't recover from that. Um, yeah. It, it's, it's sad, but um, I, I think it's, it's – it, quite often it happens. And um, I, I, there's a quote, um, I want to be, I forget who made it, who, who said it, but I want to be a really great failer. I want to fail at things great. It, 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 I want to be a tremendous failure, right? Not right. that I always want to fail, but, but that I want to I be free to fail and I want to learn from my failure because that's going to allow me to grow. Yeah, that's right. It's your definition of failure. Failure is not trying. That's what it is. It's not yeah. taking a risk and making a mistake. And, and another thing, and I, I don't want to get into this because uh, this is going to be a whole podcast in and of itself, but what, what you were saying is reminding me of this, is what about all the other factors that are out there that would tell a kid whether they're a success or a failure, right? Mm -hmm. So one of them is what you mentioned, a kid who's a superstar, probably an early birthday, right? January birthday. So they're bigger, stronger, faster. I mean, Malcolm Gladwell talks about this book, this, this story in the book, Outliers, in fact, um, where he, he talks about sports and he talks about hockey in particular, and you have, he's like, why is it that like 85, 90% of the hockey players, I don't remember the exact stat, but it was high like that. Yep. Professional hockey players are all born in January, February, or March. And the reason is because a coach looked at him and goes, look how fast that kid is. Look how strong that kid is. Look at that. Look at his mental capability and ability, right? And so then the other kids are written off, so they don't get pulled into these elite systems, right? And so only those older kids got pulled into the elite system, so their talents develop better. So this is something called the relative age effect. And this, I think this would be a fantastic podcast. My wife and I are actually writing a book on this. It's really, really her passion because we have a late born kid. We had two, actually, three, all three of them, all three of our boys. And so I have a November 20 birthday son at, an, at, at a pro club that is like La Liga where 80% of the kids are born January, February, March. So, and I know this happens all over the all over the world. I mean, this is not just here, but it's those messages that you give those kids too. Hey, you know what? You're just not as good as this other kid. You're just not as fast. You're just not, I mean, forget the fact that kid's 10 or 11 months younger yep. in puberty. Yeah. The other kid has got a full beard and the other one hasn't even gone through puberty yet <laughs> if they're a late bloomer. I mean, there's so many factors is what I'm saying. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy and it happens in all of sport. Yeah. Don't you think the relative age effect would be a great podcast to do? Oh, absolutely. There, there's so much to talk about that. And I think there, there, are, there are an awful lot of misconceptions about it as well. And um, yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's a big, big topic. And we are, we're learning more and more about it. And, and we're, we're, I believe we're trying to recognize it. Um, I think, look, we're both familiar with Spain. It's, um, they don't worry about it too much in Spain, <laughs> to be fair. In, in Spain, it's uh, survival of the fittest, this promotion relegation. Yeah. And there's good and bad things about promotion relegation. We can talk about all those things as well. Um, but in the U.S., we're trying to recognize it more. Right. But I, I think I spoke about it here, the, the, the idea of a player developer, a coach as a player developer versus a player user. Right. Um, if I'm a player user, uh, then I'm, I'm, I'm not going to give – I'm not going to give a damn about relative, relative age effect. Because right. It's all about I'm winning. Gonna I'm going to win. Yep. In the short term. No long-term vision. For sure. Yep. And, yep. That, and that's, you know, if you understand relative age effect, if you understand late developers, then, then 
often you understand that those are those are quite often the players that excel later on, that actually actually displace the early developers. So if you look, the relative age effect is very 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 prevalent in um, in youth national teams. But then if you look at full national teams, full national teams, mm-hmm. the the curve often changes. Right. Well, and yeah, the and you did, the, the, did, the the later quarter birth dates catch up and and replace the early developers. Yeah, because they've been through hell and back, right? Yes. I mean, they've yeah. had to develop all this resiliency and fight for everything. So once they finally did get to that place where they overcame, now, I mean, they've got the mindset for it. So yeah, I think this would be a great podcast. And by the way, for those of you who are listening, if you if you have some research and you know things about relative age effect, I mean, send them to us. It was great to get the responses from people for the, uh, what, I said a PDF, it ended up being like a mini ebook on how to build a trust-based team in an elite performance environment. And so we still have those available. But if you, um, if you have any, anything on relative age effect, then by all means, please uh, shoot, shoot us an email. We do, have, we do have a new email. I'll tell you this at the end too, but info at theheroicmindset.com. So we have a, um, a webpage now. But before, um, we, we have a few more minutes here, Larry. I want to dig into this because I think that Michael Jordan, and I wish I could have been an interviewer in this. I, I want to know what he learned from this that he would have done differently. You know what I mean? Yes. Because he, you know, they, they, they would show him that iPad where somebody said something about him, right? Yeah. And of course, he, you know, he cried sometimes. Yeah. Um, he dismissed things sometimes. He like, they didn't understand what was really happening. And I'm sure that Michael, knowing what he knows now, would have probably treated people differently and lived differently, right? Maybe somebody will tell that story one day. But I'd like to ask you that question because you obviously are a very elite level coach and you've been an elite level player. And now looking back, I'm wondering, you know, were they, well, I'll ask it in a question form. Larry, were there some things that uh, maybe you, you weren't so proud of as a player or coach that stand out in your mind or, or things that, gosh, you know, you were too this, that if you would have known now, you would have changed some of those things. Like, like with, now you're kind of moving into this, like, I mean, you've got all this experience. And, and so I'm sure you have those questions when you're looking back. But, but if, you, if you were speaking to your younger self, maybe what, what, would, you, what would you say? Well, I, you know, I, I guess, it, well, I'll take the player piece first. Okay. Right. And, and again, I, I, I want to be very clear on this. My, my professional playing career was nothing to write home about, right? I, I, was, not, I was not the Michael Jordan of soccer here in the United States by, by any means. <laughs> um, but I, but I, look, I managed to persevere and have a, and have a long career. Um, I, I, I think for me, I was probably – you know, I was probably the guy on the other end of things an awful lot. I was the guy being berated, right? Mm-hmm. So, so let's, I, I think I gave an illustration of, of my favorite team, right? My most successful team. Well, it was also the team where, where I was probably the guy being berated, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Or the guy that was being belittled at times, okay? Um, so I, I think, Tom, you and I spoke about this. Sometimes winning can mask things, right? Right. right. Um, so I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you a, a little story. Um, I, I wasn't, I, I probably, as I look back on my playing career, one thing I, I lacked, I lacked, I wish I was better at was probably self-confidence, right? Um, as, as I reflect back and, and I can tell you a little story about, um, when I was playing, we, we had a, we had downtime. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now I was the guy in the team. I, I always played, but I was the kind of the t- guy that was like, all right, you make the play and get the ball to the stars, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, because I wasn't the star. I was the guy. I, I worked for the stars, which was fine by me. I understood my role on the team. Okay, okay so, so, so let me ask you a question. Then, did you still believe that you could be better? Maybe not the star, but like, or did you resolve that you're, you know, you're not that guy? I, I, I wanted to be that guy, right? I think I wanted to be the star. I wanted to be the guy that, that, you know, everybody talked about winning games. I wanted to be that guy. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and I always felt like I was a better player than, than I ever ended up being. And, and part of this was my own self-confidence. Right. But here's the story. It was really, really interesting to me. Um, as I reflect now, I, I didn't think this way back then. Um, 
we had, we had, I think we had like a three month, uh, sorry, a three week break at some point in the middle of the season. We had about a three week break without a game. So it was, it was just training. Right. And for whatever reason over that three week break, I just decided that I was going to go for it. Right. And, and was there a trigger gonna, for that? What, what was the decision? I Why were you doing know, it differently now? You know, I don't know that there was a trigger for it other than, you know, it kind of just snowballed, you know, and, and because there weren't games in the middle of it. So I, I think, unfortunately, I, I, I was probably very outcome based and it was always about the game. Right. And when it should have been more about the training and for whatever reason, and maybe it was because there weren't games for three weeks. I became more about the training and about the process Mm -hmm. and it kind of snowballed one day. I was like, Oh yeah, I'm feeling pretty good. You know? And then the next day and it, and it kept going. And over this two, three week period, I was, you know, I was really good. You gained confidence. So it sounds like you're saying that like when you say you focused on the process, so there's this idea called 1% incremental gains, right? It's like, Mm -hmm. you know, you don't, you don't look at the gap between where you are now and where you want to be or where that, where that player is. You're like, I'm going to improve at least 1% every day. And then if you can do that consistently, you keep stretching yourself. Then now, you know, you look back and you've had the 60, 70% growth, right? Is that, I mean, I think that's what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. And the interesting thing was there there was no game thrown in the middle of this process. Mm -hmm. And, And the game for me was always like, Oh, does my coach like me? Is my coach happy with me? And it was so wrong, but that was some of my mindset, right? right. I, I, judged, I judged how I was doing it by, was the coach happy with me? Did he play me? Did I get the minutes I wanted? Instead of just focusing on, these are the things I control, right? So, so without having that game there, in, in that three-week time, time period, I began to take control of it. And every day I got better and better. And I was like, damn, I'm... I'm the best guy out here. Hmm. Right. And, and the coach, you could see it in his face and in his eyes. He was like, Whoa, what the hell's going on here? Who this is guy, this masked man? Who is, yeah, exactly. Like <laughs> who is this guy? Right. Who is this guy? And, and in, in, in fairness to him, when we did get back to the games, he gave me a different role, right? He moved me in, uh, higher on the field. He gave me a more prominent role. He wanted things to go through me. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So leadership. Here, here's the wrench, right? I, I got in the game, and you know, let let's say I started slow. Well, within within a half a game, I was back to being the guy. The coach put me back to being the guy that was like, just win the ball and get it to these guys, right? So that that opportunity for me could have been the, that could have been the turning point for me. But because the coach gave me a little bit of trust, but didn't stick with me long enough because the game was on the line, Mm. right? Because we're pros and it's because it's three points. Right. Uh, The game's on the line. Uh, Coach sent me back and said, no, look, go back to your other, go back to your old position, win the ball, get it to the guys there. Right. And so, so who knows? Right now that's, that's all on me because you know, I, I, I wasn't, I didn't have enough self-confidence. I, I, Mm -hmm. some things I did wrong, you know, maybe in my mindset and my way of, of thinking. And, and that's when I was like, okay, well, I know my role and I have my role. It works for me. Let me be a pro. Thanks very much. Right. And that, and that was it. And that was, I reached my, you know, I reached my, um, my, I reached my potential. Yeah. And, you know what? You're hitting on such an important point. And again, I mean, another podcast, yeah. but a coach can make or break a player. Yeah. And, and that, you know what, when, when I look back at the things I know now, that was my fixed mindset. When that happened, mm-hmm. I went, I went from three weeks of this growth mindset. Right. Focusing to, on what you could control. To within a half of a game, pretty much being told, nah, this is what you are. And I believed it. You went right back to it. Yep. Yeah. I believe it. Yeah. This is what you were, when you mentioned earlier, the self-fulfilling prophecy. So there is, there is something called Pygmalion's effect. Okay? Yes. Uh, Pygma- you're familiar with that. Pygmalion's yeah. effect. I mean, he was a, a sculptor back in the, it's a, it's a Greek kind of fable. 
and he fell in love. He, he made his, the statue perfect, unbelievable. It was a total amount of his 100% focus, and he fell in love with the statue. This is where the idea comes from. But Pygmalion's effect is that basically what other people – what, what other people believe about you, you start to believe. And then everybody else starts to believe, right? So yep. you're the best, you're the best. Oh, I, I, I mean, the coach says that to you. I am the best. Oh, well, now I'm going to start acting like the best. And then the rest of the team starts treating you like you're the best, right? Which then reinforces your own beliefs about yourself. And then yep. it goes in a circle, right? Now the coach believes that, it keeps going. They did a huge research study about this. But on the flip side, same thing. Coach doesn't believe in you. Boy, it, it, it starts a different spin, right? Well, now, mm-hmm. oh, maybe I'm not that good. And then the, your teammates start treating you like, well, you know, you're not a key player and you really can't do this. That, man, that's really true. And then they start treating you that way, which then reinforces it, right? That's the idea of that circle of the yeah. self-fulfilling prophecy. And if you haven't got a really clear mindset, who you want to be, what your values are, what your vision is, focusing on what you can control, all the things we're talking about, developing a heroic mindset, then something like that, a, a, the wrong coach can really derail you for, I mean, it can be, it can be devastating. Yeah, we talk about it. And I, I, I was, you know, I probably didn't have a strong enough idea of who I was. And I was probably just uh, in this survival mode, right? Mm -hmm. Every day I was going to train. I was just like surviving. I just want to keep my job. I want to get my paycheck. You know, that's probably where I was. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And that's why I think that this kind of training is so important, right? Is that if we can help instill the sooner, the better into athletes, if we can help them instill who they are, what's important, what they care about, right? I I was just on a a zoom today, several hours with a LSU women's soccer team. This is exactly what, what we're talking about, right? that you got to develop the values of your team. I took a lot of the motivation and inspiration from Carrie last week about how they, how they did that. It becomes so critical because then, yeah, you're playing to win, right? But then it's, it's now it's who we are, right? I mean, this is, th- these are the values that we care about. This is who we're going to be at a team. No matter if we're winning or we're losing, we're always going to do this, right? And yeah. if you don't have that framework, if you don't have that foundation, then you are, you're in that survival mode that you talk about. And it's, it's, it's really tough. Um, all right. So tell me, a co- I, I'd like to know, like when you, none of my boys were coached by you. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm just asking this as an open question. Are there things that maybe you aren't so proud of that, that you, you as a coach back in the past, maybe you would have done differently or if you would have known what you know now that you would have coached differently or you just, maybe you weren't, as engaged as you should have been, or like, I mean, uh, what, what, what would that look like? I mean, what, if you could go back in time to your, to your, to yourself, uh, mm-hmm. and maybe not one of your finer moments, what, what did that look like? Well, th- there are a lot of them. <laughs> there are a lot of them. Um, you know, I, I can, I can, I can say pretty confidently now that, you know, earlier in my, my, um, my coaching career, I was, I was probably, uh, a fairly toxic coach. Right. You know, I, it, it, it was all about winning for me. I, I, you know, I came from that pro environment, you know, where, where, yeah, it's, it's about winning and it's about using players to win games. Right. And, and I pushed, man, I, I, I pushed hard and, and it was probably, you know, it was like survive, right. Or you're going to be replaced, you know, mm-hmm. and, and I had to be my, killed. Yeah. And I had my idea of, of, what a, a future professional player looked like and what this mentality that we talk about in my mind looked like. And it was, it, it, you know, in, in some ways it was, it was pretty Jordan-esque, right. In, in some ways. Um, and you either fit, you either fit into what I had in my mind, you know, that a player was going to be, or, or you didn't, you know, you, you had, you had no place. Hmm. Right. Um, and then it, it, it I, uh, an interesting story. Uh, I started to do more, more of this, this French coursework. Um, and I was at, I was at Claire Fontaine, um, doing, uh, the elite formation coaches license. And there was a French coach, um, working with, working with a team. And I, and I and if I recall correctly, it was probably 15 year olds or, or thereabout. Okay. And he brought his team in right, right before the training started. And he was explaining some things to the players and off to the side, one of the players, as the coach is explaining to the group off to the side, one of the players grabs a ball 
and he starts juggling the ball while the coach is talking to the rest of the team. <laughs> Uh-oh. This, this players off juggling the ball, right? And I was like, oh, wait, are you kidding me? <laughs> this, that's disrespectful. There's n- in my, in my team, he wouldn't, there's no way he would be out. Right. So <laughs> it, it, it was a question that we asked the, the, the coach, the French coach. And, and he said, uh, I, we said to him, he, he wasn't paying attention. How can you? And he said, Oh no, I know him. That's just how he learns. That's what he does as he's listening. Hmm. How and, interesting. And it, it really opened my mind to this idea that, everyone is different mm-hmm. right and and that we really need we we need to coach to the individual right and and that we can't i i don't think we can um we can impose our ideas our 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 lines to the players right we need to we need to allow them this creativity um to learn how they want to learn Right. Such a and, good point. And, and I, I think this comes down to this, the, the idea of outcome. So it, one of the things that I, prob, I, I, I know I used to do this, I, if my teams won, I was good. I was a good coach. I was doing a good job. Right. right? It, was a, it was a, then you're a winner. They win, you're yes. a winner. Yes. So I, I've learned, again, I've learned that that's, in the end, at the end of the season, there's only one winner. So for, for, for the vast majority of teams and players that don't win the championship, what are we? We're, mm. we're all losers? Right. Right. So, so mm. I, I didn't like that idea. So what I've begun to do more and more with my teams now is my, my benchmarks for success are much different. Okay. And, and I can tell you what we did here in, in Cincinnati, right? Yeah, yeah. There was, there's a way we want to play in Cincinnati. There's a style of play that we want in Cincinnati. So we took what, what, what we wanted to benchmark for our first year. And bear in mind, these are players that are, most of our players have not played in the development academy before, mo- certainly not in an MLS academy before. So they were getting into a much higher level than, than they were used to. But we, we took certain benchmarks that we wanted to have. For instance, uh, our, our passing percentages, right? How many passes we made in a game. Um, where we passed on the field, where we were passing on the field. We wanted, we wanted to set the foundation for our, our game model, our style of play, which is to dictate possession, which is to play through the thirds, all very technical things. But, mm-hmm. but my point is we took these benchmarks because we wanted to see where they are, right? Where, where our teams ended up at the end of our season if we achieved these benchmarks and not to look at whether we won or lost, but are we, are we getting better at our benchmarks for future success, for long-term success, Mm -hmm. right? And sure enough, our benchmarks, we were top three in the country with both age groups. Wow, Wow. that's an overwhelming success. Mm. But for the vast majority of people, if you looked at our record, to be be quite honest with you, I don't even know where our records are. I I, I, Honestly, I don't (laughs) even look. I, That's I great. Our, I love it. I love it. I, I believe our 15s were, were somewhere in playoff contention. I don't believe our 17s were. But for the vast majority of people, they would look at it and go, ah, you didn't have a great year. And I sit there and go, no, we had a super year. Mm, right. Because you were clear about what that looked like. Yeah. And it wasn't so, just like a perfect season or winning the league or whatever. And, and it, it allows – I think it allows flexibility and pressure, right? And, and I, think, I think a good coach understands pressure or comfort. And I think mm-hmm. a good coach mm-hmm. need, understands when to increase the pressure a little bit and when to let the pressure off a little bit. So if I say it's only about winning, well, the pressure's there. I can't do anything about it. So I can't help somebody. I can't help someone to grow if we don't win. Right, right. So you, you, you put a lot in that. I mean, that was packed so if you if you you could say to a coach who's out there um with all of your experience who's really saying listen yeah i want to create a winning culture i want to do it the right way right i I want to um i want to do a lot of the things that that they're hearing you talk about what would be like the top 
two or three or four things that they should focus on that would help them to really be a player developer, right? To develop a team over the long haul, to create an environment, a climate that is healthy, but is of course hardworking and focusing on winning and all that. What would be your, your coaching to them to make sure that these things are in place for a coach? That's, that's a really, I'm going to tell you, that's a difficult question, right? Because, because I think it's something that we have to discover for ourselves, hmm. right? And, and, and uh, let's start with this assumption. Um, I am not a genius. <laughs> and and, and, and I, I don't have all the answers, right? But I'll follow it up with a quote. And this is a quote from Pat Summit, who's a, a – She's passed away, um, sadly, but she was the women's basketball coach at Tennessee, just a, a Hall of Fame coach, right? Mm -hmm. Know who she is, yeah. And, and this is her quote. The willingness to experiment with change may be the most essential ingredient to success at anything. Mm. Wow. And, and for me, when I realized it was okay that this was all an experiment, right, and that I wasn't being judged by, by my players if my training session was shit. And I've had some shitty training sessions, right? <laughs> and it's okay. I'll tell my players. I go, oh, guys, boy, that was a shitty training session. <laughs> Sorry about that one. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I'll go out to them before training. I'll say, this is what I'm going to do today. Guys, I'm experimenting with this. I don't know how it goes, but let's see if we can solve it together. If not, we'll just put the ball out there and you'll play, right? And – and I think this idea of experimenting and this idea of change, if you're basing everything on winning and you're not winning a championship every year like the Chicago Bulls, you're losing. Hmm. Hmm. So try something different. Right. Think about something Mix different. Experiment. Right. See right. what works for you. Right? Talk with your players about it. They'll come up, they'll come up with some great answers. It really yeah. will. Yeah, I think you're making a really good point. Like, if you are stuck doing the same thing over and over, right? I mean, that's where you're really in, in trouble. I think that's what, what, what that quote is, is all about, which say, say, say that quote again, by the way. The willingness to experiment with change may be the most essential ingredient to success at anything. Wow. Yeah. You know, so I, I teach this whole thing, Larry, that um, I actually open up leadership processes with this, where I put on the board two columns on one, on the left is slow death. On the right is deep change. And I ask everybody, what does it look like? You could do this for an athlete or a coach or uh, an executive C-suite leader. Um, when, when somebody is stuck in slow death, so think about it as an athlete. If an athlete is stuck in slow death, what does it look like? And everyone will tell you, right? And I write on this laundry list of things, right? Uh, they don't believe in themselves. They start to get negative. They, their motivation, it, it, starts to, it starts to wane. Like they'll tell you exactly what it looks like. And really what they're doing is describing themselves. And, mm. and, and the whole idea of this, it comes from a, a, a PhD out of the University of Michigan, Robert Quinn, one of my favorite authors, one of my favorite leadership authors. And, and he really says, you're in one of two places in life. You're either, you're in one of these two. And then deep change, right, is uh, then I ask them, all right, now, if you see an athlete or you see a leader who is in deep change, they're in the deep change process, they're transforming, they're, they're, they're doing all of these things differently, what does that look like? And they'll, they'll describe it to you exactly. And it's what you're saying. They're, they're experimenting. They're taking yeah. risk. They're mixing it up, right? They're keeping their mindset, you know, in a healthy place. They're learning. They're growing. It's all these things, Right. And I think that, that it, when you get stuck in anything in life, that is when you start to stagnate and you start to die, so to speak. Yeah. Right? That's the slow death process. And we don't have the laws of the universe on our side because part of the other thing that's going, going on here is that the second law of thermodynamics, which is true, whether we like it or not, says that all things lead towards entropy, right? Which is decay, like chaos, confusion. This is why you need good coaches. This is why you need to mix it up. This is why you need change with this Pat Summit quote, which I think is so brilliant. Um, yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. Okay, so last question. Hmm. Um, and I know, I mean, I'm putting you on the spot here. This is, this is <laughs> not scripted. Um, what would you say to a player? 
so if, if you if you would knowing what you know now, right, about what you wish you would have known then, and you could have worked on, right? If if I would have just known this, if I would have known to invest some time here, I think, wow, it could have given me a competitive advantage. It could have helped me not mm -hmm. be in so much survival. It would have helped me have more peak performances. What, what, would, what would you coach your younger athlete self to focus um, on? It's so funny. I think about this so often and, I, and I, I try to do it when I can with my players. And, you know, and, and I don't, I, I, my coaching now is, is kind of limited to when I have a national team. So it's not, I'm not doing it day to day. Um, here's, here's what I'll say. Uh, and I, I would say this to my younger self and I would say this to, uh, to my older self coach, um, to my younger self, I would say, you have permission to be great. Mm. And, and to my, to my older self, um, you have permission to give others greatness. Wow. Right. To allow others to be great. Mm. Cause it, I'm, it, it's, I, I work on this idea of permission so often because it's so freeing, right? You know, when you have permission to, I tell all my coaches, you have permission to experiment. Oh man. So I can do nothing wrong. I can just try this. Really? Mm -hmm. You have permission to experiment. Go right. be great. Take risk. Yeah. Do whatever yeah. it takes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I love that. I love that. And, and, and I think it's a message that, that, that needs to be, that needs to be central, right? Mm -hmm. Because so much of the time we think we, you know, we, it's that short term mentality that you were talking about. And so when I'm just trying to win, I'm just trying to do exit. I mean, the growth piece of that goes out the window, doesn't it? Yeah. And, and Tom, it goes back to everything you talk about fear too, right? Right. How fear fear is, the, is the greatest motivator, right? So, so when you give people permission not to be afraid, wow. It changes yep. everything, doesn't it? Changes it? everything. Yeah, yeah. This is um, this is the another idea. Podcast. It's another podcast. <laughs> it's another podcast. It, it it is. It is. But you know, you're exactly right. I mean, from a from a, a positive psychology standpoint, it's called the broaden and build theory. That mm -hmm. when I start to think differently, when I start seeing, when I stop seeing events in my life as a threat or as a negative, I I failed here. I didn't do this. When you do that, it shuts you down. Right? Then you won't take risk. You won't do these things. But when you start to think differently. It's okay to take risk. It's okay. Like the change process, it's part of it. That the broaden and build theory says that it opens up our, our brains to a completely different process, right? We start to see, you start to see the field as a, as a player differently than you would before. You start to create more than you would have before. I mean, you know, think about the time that you've seen a soccer game. I'm sure everybody has been there where like the creativity on the field is just ridiculous, right? You're like, Oh my gosh, I cannot believe they just pulled that play off yeah, that led to that goal. Right? It I mean, changes your perception of everything. Completely. And, and every action on a soccer field starts with perception. It starts with taking in information. Hmm. So true, right? And, and, it, and it leads to the, the, the truth of the importance of what I think we're, we're really trying to get across, and that is that we've got to spend as much time developing these aspects of the game as we do the technical aspects of the game, right? That you're, you're, not, you're not just raising, you're not just trying to raise a, a great soccer player, a great football player, a great tennis player, whatever your sport is. You're also trying to raise, a, a lead a great human being. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so who's successful in everything in life. You want them to be as successful on the field as they are in their friendships, as they will be in their marriages, as they will be in, as, as parents, right? This is like, I mean, these are lessons that you go throughout life and people tell you this, that I learned the greatest lessons in my life as being an athlete, right? And yes. so you, you, you've got to pursue, like you pursue the, the technical side, you've also got to pursue the life equation side, which is all these things that we're, we're discussing, how you handle failure, all of these things, because they're just as important. Absolutely, yep. yep. Fantastic. Wow, this has been great. <laughs> that was fun. That's yeah, fun. it is. It is. It is. And I, I love hearing your insights on all of these things. And because you have so much experience and so much to bring to that, I think that 
that people can really, really learn from? Because I, I mean, that's the great question, isn't it? If you know, if you knew what you knew now, what would you say to your younger self as a coach or yeah. as a, you know, uh, an athlete or whatever that looks like? And, you know, we don't have that, but we can pass that on to others. Right. And, um, I mean, there is no magic time machine it would be nice if we could, but, yeah. um, but that's what this is about. Right. And that's what great coaches do. I think too. I think it's true. The idea of looking back and looking forward. Makes awesome. That's yeah. right. That's right. All right. Well, we're going to pick a great topic for next time. I'm really excited that we've got a, a lot of guests who are lined up. Um, I'm talking to a number of, of actual players, La Liga players and, um, some of them are rising stars. I know you're talking to all kinds of people and coaches. And so, um, again, this is, uh, this is rich. This has been fantastic. So Larry, thank you so much for being open and, 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 and revealing your failures, right? Because that's, I think, another big part of how people learn. Keeps me learning. That's what life is about. That's what yep. life is about. So thank you, everybody. We are really grateful that you continue to listen in. Our, we, we're looking and, and it's just so, so incredible to see people listening from many different countries and, and our audience growing. We, we'd love for you to tell other people about the Heroic Mindset podcast. Uh, we have the website set up now and it just, it, right now it just has the podcasts on it. We're going to be providing all kinds of resources there. Uh, we're going to be taking the things we're talking about and making them into, into manuals, training tools, PDFs. And again, we still have this one PDF. If you want, if you'd like it, you're, you're more than welcome to email us at info at the heroic mindset.com. That email comes directly to Larry and I, and we're going to develop more of those things, right? Because we want to provide tools for you that help. We want to learn from others. I was just talking on our Facebook page. We have a private Facebook group. Um, and we were talking, I was talking today to Edwin about all this stuff on Michael Jordan and how, what he learned as a professional athlete. And I'm gathering some of those things for podcasts and for, for other resources and tools. We want to, we want to provide those things to you so that we can help you be your very best wherever you are in life as a coach, as an athlete, uh, or if you're, you just, you love sport and you're listening to our podcast. So, uh, until next time, uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks so much for tuning in. Take care, everyone.